Okay, it looks like we're live <laughs> after those technical issues. I'm going to give the other people who are in the, um, that were signing up for the previous one. Oop, I got a feedback. Okay, can you hear me okay? Is it working? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we're live now. <laughs> Those technical errors and hopefully um, this will be working now and we won't have any errors going forward and we'll be able to... Oh, why is it not working? Oh my gosh, hang on. Okay, sorry. Now I can... Uh, this is a mess. I am so sorry. We'll have to go back and edit this. Um... Let me chat with my assistant to make sure that it's working on her end. <laughs> I love technology so much. I know it's frustrating, especially when you are on the time schedule or People expect it to be live and then, ah, it doesn't work. Okay. After all of that, I'm gonna, hopefully, she says it's working. So let's go ahead and do some quick introductions and um, start like some casual chat and all that. And then we will go into um, the uh, more in-depth stuff in a moment after everybody gets a chance to log in. How does that sound? That's good to me. Okay. Perfect. Everybody can hear us, it looks like, in the chat. So I am very excited. Um, we've got some people logging in. And uh, yeah, so I'll start off, as you guys know, Adele Shaw from the Willing Equine. And we're going to be chatting today about um, horse behavior and its relationship to saddle fit. And then I do want to particularly dive into Western saddle fit. Uh, and so thank you so much for joining us today. And I can't wait to talk more. Would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Yes, Adele. Thank you for having me at your channel. My name is Jochen Schleser. I grew up in Buenos Aires. My dad taught physics and math in German school all around the world. Then we went back to Germany and um, there I fell in love with horses, grew up on horses, actually always rode on horses, even in Argentina. And then I met a um, Canadian and we fell in love, married and moved to Canada. Now I live in Canada and half of the time of the year, I live in Florida. So I got into this um, saddle making and horses because I absolutely loved how a human and a horse can be like one, like the God, you know, Zeus. <laughs> They're not Zeus. Um, now I'm gonna uh, have a huge tongue tied here. Um, <laughs> what's that Greek goddess who, who oh. half man, half horse? Oh man, I don't I, even know, but I, I know who I, you're talking about. <laughs> I can't believe I'm messing this up. Anyway, <laughs> but I just love loved it so much to see how. Uh, the communication between a human and, a, and an animal could be so close. And all I ever wanted as a kid was riding and com uh, competing, growing up with horses, very quick. I noticed all of a sudden they don't want to come to the fence anymore. All of a sudden they didn't enjoy work anymore. Just like in one of the videos you have on your website, you know, find out what's the problem. And just like you said in your videos and on your website, you know, my dad always taught us the person who knows the how will always follow the person who knows the why. So I made this to my calling that I will build saddles. But first, why does it need to be built for the rider and for the horse? And 
I thought, who would I ask? Who would really know? The sponsored rider? The last champion? I mean, I rode for Germany as a three-day event rider, English. And I had Saros. And my students asked me what saddle should I buy. I was paid to say, go with saddle, make ABC, whatever I was sponsored. But did that really fit the horse? No. Did that fit them? Uh, maybe. So when the fitters came around, and I noticed this when I got different saddle sponsored, I noticed they contradicted itself. So when I said to myself, get to the bottom, there is something really wrong when you girth up the horse, the horse swinches, bites you, swishes with the tail, so it doesn't want to come back anymore. Clearly, it's the saddle. And then, um, so we thought, okay, for the rider, I asked the people who know the anatomy of the horse. And, sorry, the anatomy of the, the human. And the anatomy of the horse would be, of course, the veterinarians. Because in the end, we want to fit the biomechanics, the physiology. And then I thought, okay, I can only sell and make so many saddles. How can I help more horses? So we created an academy called Saddle Fit for Life. And I wrote a book, which I saw you have on your resource, <laughs> Suffering and Silence. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, I thought there is so much to know. And when I lost my best friend, my best friend, my horse, who jumped through fences, he could not see the land. And he trusted me so much. Mm. Because of ill-fitting saddles, I called my dad and says, I know my calling. I want to build saddles and help people worldwide so they never really run into horses would have behavior issue, pain issues, but scars from saddles. So here I am, happy to talk to you and answer all the questions. That's, I love that whole story. And just, it's always really interesting to me to hear how people got to where they are and how their passions and they just following that passion and then putting it into work and just how can I help horses? How can I help people? Um, I have <laughs> growing up, I grew up uh, competing in hunter jumper and then in dressage and you are going to absolutely cringe at this. Mm -hmm. um, I cringe now. And we actually would buy a saddle for it. Well, first of all, we all rode on lesson ponies and lesson horses, and they all had five, there was five saddles and you could use them on any of the lesson horses. <laughs> that was a cringe to begin with. None of those saddles, it was impossible for any of them to fit any of the horses. And the lesson horses were everything from a little 13 hand high Arabian to a 16 to, you you know, roll up and down narrow thoroughbred to a round quarter horse pony. I mean, and the one saddle was supposed to be able to fit all of them. Then when we would upgrade, you know, to our own horses, we would get our saddles. Or if we start riding the, you know, not so lesson horse horses like leasing or whatever, we would, um, we would buy a saddle, but we would go to the saddle shop and we would find a saddle that fit us. And then we would just take it home and ride on any horse with that saddle. And we would use shims and lift riser pads and more pads and more pads and more pads. Um, and it was just terrible. I actually remember I had um, a, a thoroughbred. He was an off the track thoroughbred. And I remember getting out of the saddle one day and this was uh, just after one of my lessons and he actually had open raw bleeding withers from my saddle and I went to my trainer at the time and I asked her what to do and she said well you need to get a riser pad uh, and looking back I was just like well no wonder he started bucking after fences violently and throwing riders and then we had to retire him because he didn't want to jump anymore well he actually just didn't want the saddle to hurt him anymore yeah. And so I have become very passionate too about the connection between behavior and saddle fit, but not even just saddle fit, other forms of pain too. And that's why I tended to go towards that um, behavior consultant route because I I work with saddle fitters, I work with body workers, I work with vets, I work with everybody. Like, where's the source of pain coming from? Uh, but saddle is a huge one. So I'm loving that we're having this conversation today because it can help so many horse people out there help their horses to just not be in pain from a basic or not, it's not real basic. It's actually complicated, but saddle fit change. It's, it's such an important piece of the puzzle when it comes to behavior. Yes, yes, it's absolutely true. And um, hopefully we can share with you and your audience a couple of tips what to look for. For sure. Um, today, is the, I think you said you have stuff to share with us. You have pictures and slides yes. and all of that. Okay, yes, great. Before I answer, I'm going to share my screen. 
Perfect. And then go from there. Okay. So um, let's start with this picture. Um, people know, let me just move my camera out a little bit. There you go. And um, people look at the uh, working equitation saddle. This is becoming very popular. Comes from um, Portugal and Spain. Um, very popular sport also here yeah, slowly more and more in, this, in the States. Then of course we got our dressage saddle, and we got our eventing saddle or general purpose saddle. And when we make saddles, we're not just doing general purpose dressage or working equitation. We also look at the racing saddle or exercise saddle or what we call the fusion, which is half English, half Western. And then of course you mentioned we want to talk a little bit about Western saddles. Now, what I find absolutely fascinating, um, this is from, like I said, from a medical officer, you know, who, who says, the saddle has to fit the rider. Like you said, you, you said you went to the tax shop and fit a saddle, what fits you? Now, if you look back since 7,000 years, people look, how can you make the interface between saddle and person, like for saddle and horse, really, really good. I mean, why? What, the number one was to control more of the weapons and that the horse lasts longer. So when people say, well, bareback riding is much, much better than um, a saddle, then we look at this uh, when the Europeans came over to North America, you see the American natives riding bareback a couple of years later, they all had saddles. They all had saddles, not because they says, oh, I can't ride without saddles. They had saddles because they noticed a massive difference in the horse. Horse was faster, lasted longer, and also the weapon were easier to control. So that was when the saddles evolved. And when we look through medieval times, you know, when, when people had metal on themselves, look how big the weight bearing surface was. And then we got, of course, our Asian saddles, and then back to the modern English tree. And you can see the bars get narrow and narrow on the sides. From, from that on, like you said, you rode hunter jumper before and a little bit dressage, came the officer saddle, and they had a saddle where they made a little narrow, but always had these big, big bars on the bottom. And then notice very, very quick, you know, so when we make a saddle with the English saddle, look at the surface area from the side on uh, the original saddle to Western saddle, much bigger wide bearing surface where the English tree, the modern English tree are quite of a, a problem, I would say, because we have so much more pressure points due to the fact that the bars are so narrow. So saddle came through, through long times and it goes back to the way it was from 200 years ago, where they make the top bar very narrow for the rider. And it looks like an English tree, but the bottom one with these big wide Western bars underneath. So kind of like backwards, like they were made that for hundreds and hundreds of years ago, except less military, more for um, English saddle or racing saddles. Now on racing, they let's go, is my horse faster? Is my horse less nose bleeding? Does my horse have different behavior? If you look at the racing saddles, how they used to look, they look much straighter. Their jockey was sitting more in the back. Of course, the racing saddles are much, much different these days. And um, it is super nice to see, like you write on your website, that you like the trained science space. And when I started to, to make saddles and I worked on many different saddle companies throughout Europe, everybody had the different way how to make saddles. But when it came to fitting, I said, it, it's the same animal. It's, an, it's a horse which has anatomy, physiology, biomechanics. Why do we make them so different? Sure, one is Western, one is English, but the tissue, the muscle is the same. So what really blew me away absolutely blew me away when a medical doctor wrote how different the male and female spinal curvature is 
And from there on, it was recommended we butt cast the male and the female. And I noticed on your videos, you were like my daughter, very tall and slim. <laughs> and uh, her boyfriend was very tall and slim too. So they look identical almost. But when you see the seat bone, on the female pelvis, it's much lower in the crotch. Seat bones are much narrow. And the seat bone on the guy, much narrow in the back, not as wide as the female. And there's hardly any indentation in the front. Now, we just met without being rude. The guys can put their soft parts left or right. The girls can't do it, right? So when you look at this, how you sit in the saddle, any saddle, Okay, jumping, eventing, racing side, you stand in your stirrup. Well, once in a while, you sit down. And when you sit down, there is so much less room in the crotch area, not just your soft bones, your hard bones. These bones here, these are the, the front bones of your pelvis called the pubic symphysis, and there's much more space for the bones. I'm strictly talking about the bones, okay, for the guy. So now you got to think about for thousands and thousands of years, saddles were made by men for men for, to ride. But in English, 95% of riders are women now. 95% in English and over 75% for in Western. So if I make a ground seat on the Western seat, okay, on a Western saddle, for this shape, where the pelvis is much narrow seat bone very high, this rider will have some difficulties. Why? Because you're, and this is now science-based, this is not based on opinion. When medical doctors write, one human being has the chance to bear a child, the other one doesn't. The bone structure, not just the spinal curvature, it's so different that we actually need to think about how do we make the saddles. And that's why it's so cool that now they make Western saddles for the birth channel, for the non-birth channel. And when I say that, it's because there are some guys who are really big guys, heavy, big guys. And there's some girls who are very, very, very slim, hardly have any hips. But the difference between the big guy and the slim lady, he will never have the bone structure, the spinal curve or the pelvis like the slim girl has, because this is what you're sitting on, bareback or not. So once I looked at this, this okay, we do have the bareback pads or treeless saddles. Okay, so how does the pelvis sit on the back and why would I need a tree? And why were the American natives switching to saddles when they have ridden so long bareback? Well, through science, we know there is spinal nerves what comes out. And when we put pressure on the spine, the horse will not last long. Here's the good part about the Western and the bad part about the English. No matter what Western tree you have, how expensive or inexpensive, they always have a man's fist distance here. On English saddles, not every English saddle has the spinal clearance. The spinal clearance is so crucial. See, here's an English sound, see how narrow that is? That is so crucial to stay off the spine. So when we look at behavior, and this is the best what I learned from um, a veterinarian in Wisconsin, his name is Tracy Turner. He teaches saddle fitting behavior to his vets every year, over 2000 of his colleagues. And he says, don't wait for 20 minutes until the spinal nerves are numb. Pay attention to the first eight circles. The second the saddle goes on the horse, the rider rides. Is the eye soft? Is the ear forward? Are there any wrinkles in the nose? Is the mouth soft? Is he licking? Is he chewing? Right, so the horse, if you look at the eyes and the ears, they don't know how to laugh, right? So they are as straightforward as one, two, three. Like what you said with your wither pad lifter. Okay, so that's what we've all been taught. So now, yeah, the saddle doesn't pinch on top of the bone anymore, but now it bites on the side. On the Western saddle, we call it the bar width. Okay, so how far this, in the old days, we called that 
quarter horse fit, semi quarter horse fit, Arabian fit. Now we go more specific, anywhere from four inch to four and a half to nine inches. This is the tree weight. So now let's say it's already pinching on the side. And then you say, so what? It's just tissue. Well, for 35 million years when horses fight and breathe each other, you know, what do they do? They bite around the withers. That ignites a nerve, what stops the horse from going forward. Oh, he's a lazy horse. So you might stop the bleeding of the withers, but by stuffing wither pads in between, okay, or shims, this becomes even narrow. The analogy I would like to give is if you have a saddle, sorry, a shoe, and you're a beautiful athlete, you're one of your best track and fields in your high school or in your sport, whatever you do, and you already had blood blisters on your pinky because the shoe is too narrow. So now somebody will say, oh, put an insole in, put extra socks in it, it cushions your foot. Then you want to look and it says, that makes absolutely no sense because then it's even smaller. But what if you don't have a choice? What if, if they force that sock on your foot and force your foot in there? What we do sometimes with horses, we just do something we don't know, you know, and then we go, we go with shim pads, Western or English, same thing, and we make it worse. And this is what we hopefully can avoid. So what I like, what I like is the simple rule. Everybody can see the end of the mane. Everybody can see the horse's ring of lights. At the flank, the way the sun hits, or if you install the light, why is the color different here than where his butt is or in front of that line? Why is it different? Because the hairline comes up through the flank and goes forward. And here the hairline comes back and goes back. The horse is outside and gets rained on it. You see the water run down here on this line, also known as the rain line. So the old rule was, an English tree should never sit past the mane and on the ring of light. See how this side here is on the ring of light? A Western tree, the bar, the front bar, okay, the flare, needs to be from that concho on, if my hand is the horse, needs to flare out. That's why we call it the flare. It needs to stay off. Now, why is that so important? Because underneath that concho, on the horse's um side let me show you here here's the end of the mane this is an english saddle and you see a lot of space here so if you go to the end of the mane and you go six inches down at the end of the mane there's a spot what the acupuncture veterinarians or body workers call bl13 that's a bladder meridian point you don't need more pressure than the same amount of pressure you would use when you squish a grape that's not a lot of pressure. So when you press on that spot, on that spot, the heart rate goes elevated, right? That's a lung meridian point. So if I know there's a point what stresses the horse out, horse will go, but his heart rate, his pulse is way up. What does that mean in racing? That means that your horse has a higher beat per minute, not very fast. What does it mean in a pleasure horse or a rainer or a cutter or a dressage horse, that means higher risk of ulcers, colic, and he's always tired. Okay, so if a horse has elevated pulse, elevated heart rate, has an increased cortisol in the level, that's how we test on humans when the horse is in stress. So, or the human. So, why do I want that pressure there? So therefore, six inches down at the end of the main, there's a spot on the Western side that would be probably in this area here. There's a spot you definitely don't want to hit on your saddle when it's on the horse. So a very easy trick is if you put your saddle on the horse, no pack, no rider, no shins, just put it on where you think it needs to sit. You can go into more detail. Then you take a pen or pencil. Pencil or a pen what is unified the same thickness. And while it's on there, that pen should be easily sliding to the center of your fork without any contact. If you have a big fat area like a marker or even thicker distance, well then obviously the fat the, the flare is way too much. 
If you can't get that in here, okay, if you have to force that between the horse's shoulder and the horse, not only do you put a lot of pressure on the bladder meridian point, you also do, this happened to my horse, you do a lot of damage with this irreplaceable, irreparable, which is when a human gets his ear cut off or his nose cut off, there is no cartilage pill you can buy to regrow your nose or your ear. Once that cartilage is cut off, that's it. So on the top of the shoulder blade, and this is not what, um, what saddle feet has come up with. This is on YouTube, okay? So here is that bladder meridian point I was talking about, BL13, that's six inches down from the end of the mane. Okay, then there's other spots. Maybe later we can talk a little bit about breast plates and girth, right? How important it is that that works. So no matter what saddle it's on there, racing, English, Western, endurance, if you look at this pink bar, this horse here can carry a lot of weight for a long time without getting aggressive. I can make every horse's tongue come out on the left or on the right when you ride. I can make him rear, I can make him buck, I can make him trip, I can make him get really hyperventilated. I just have to hit any of those trigger points. When people say, what's a trigger point? Well, we all have done this to ourselves, accidentally hit that funny bone. That funny bone, that nerve ending goes all the way to your pinky and you can feel it. So what if you purposely hit that trigger point? You don't like it. But let's say you don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, I put you in a bridle with or without bit, put you in a saddle no matter what, and then I just ground tie you or put you in the cross tie and I keep hitting your bunny bone and you have no choice. And then people say, oh, look at Adele. Look how she's twitching and her arm is always doing this. Adele doesn't talk. She does. She shows her ears. <laughs> Maybe don't fly back like she can do on the horse, but her eyes might go big and she might start biting or stamping. Okay, so, of course, when you hit Adele or yourself long enough on that funny bone, eventually that nerve gets numb and that reaction, muscle, movement, all disappears. The hardest part, the hardest part is this part here, the shoulder blade. So when you look at the horse, how it moves, here I sit on the horse further back and you can see in slow motion how the muscle contracts and boom, there it comes back. I don't really pay attention to that or that side. You can see zack loads and then it comes back. So which each step, that upper arm pushes the shoulder back. So if I'm using this little pony leg here, okay, this is the upper arm, here's the elbow, Here's the shoulder blade. Every time this goes forward, that shoulder blade goes upwards back. So you kind of see it there. Okay. So here is an English saddle with the Western bars underneath. So the Western bar could look just like that. That's why I use this picture. You can see how when the horse moves, okay, there is actual space and freedom. Now, this is a picture from a short jumper who who jumps a meter 50. So when people look at this and say, oh my God, that saddle is very loose, quite the contrary. Okay. This is a slow motion without saddle pad sitting correctly. And there's no digging in the shoulder. From the side, it would look like this. Okay, so look at how the side picture looks like, how the shoulder rolls in and it comes, touches here, and then it rolls out. And you can see how the flare, none of the skin is wrinkled, none of the uh, part is digging. Now, this is a very hard thing to do because not every horse likes to go without any Western pads. But if you have a horse who lets you do it and you take the saddle off and the horse's hair looks absolutely smooth, no pressure, no wrinkles in here, then what you achieve is a movement, a saddle fit. We call it a dynamic saddle fit because everybody can make saddles and fit saddles and say, look how the saddle fits standing. What if you want a saddle which fits while the horses actually walk, trot, cantering? 
So as I said, leg goes forward, the upper arm pushes the scapula six, four to six inches back. Now, sometimes I have massive horses, like really, really big, big horses, big horses with shoulder blades who are really, really big. Okay, so let me see if I find one here too, I can demonstrate. For example, a Frisian. Okay, so you can see how that sticks out there. How is that gonna happen if you have a rawhide or a metal reinforced or a plastic tree digging into it? Now we have beautiful tools. It goes back to science, you know, where we can measure how much pressure while you ride is there. Unfortunately, sometimes we see this and they come to me, I don't train horses or judge anymore, but we've tried to find saddles. I said, can you find a saddle where this horse's back swings a little bit more? This is completely fused. The neck is fused, the back is fused, the SI is fused, okay? Once the horse gets enough damage from the saddle, the body protects itself. I talked about the nose, the ears when that goes broken off. Here's a veterinarian from New Zealand who shows English saddle or Western saddle doesn't matter. If this metal or the bar dig in, here's the shoulder blade underneath. You're looking at the horse dissect from the side. Here they took the shoulder blade and the cartilage off. All this is abnormal. That's all damage from the saddle. So if we know this scientifically, we know what dry spot means, we know what wrinkle means, we know what atrophy and white hair means, and we know we can buy apps. Let me rephrase this. We know there's apps for free or take a three day, a three day, a 3D picture of the horse or to, for measurement purpose, or it takes the vital signs of the horse, such as the heart rate, calorie burn, cadence, elevation, trot, symmetry. This, where they make the money, you rent or buy this. I always call it the Apple Watch or the Fitbit for horses. You slide it on the girth and then you get to see, right? Because there is no more opinion. I always like to say saddles need to be evidence-based. Okay? So if you are a jockey and you race horses, I guarantee you, you have very short legs, sorry, short stirrup leathers, and your knee goes very forward but it stays under the sternum of the horse. Your butt goes way back, but this is a unique part, no matter what you write. English, racing, Western, sternum, ball of the foot and sternum of the horse will always align. No bareback rider will sit back here. They all sit, or rodeo riders, they all sit at the base of the horse. Now your saddle, English or Western, has to place the front part of the pardon me crotch to the front of the saddle now remember what i showed you with the lady's bone right lady's pelvis it's very low the guy is very hard and i very hard um high in the front bone so when i have a pubic symphysis but it's very high in the front the ground seat on the western saddle you just look from the side of the saddle, right? It's high in the front and then goes down all the way to the cantle. And then it comes against and you we call it the pocket. Okay. Now, if I put 70% or 75% of the female riders, they sit back. They sit back. This is all man-made damage on this horse. Huh? This is an X-race horse. They are their fault. This is an international European Grand Prix dressage horse. From one day to the next, over, done. She doesn't want to move anymore. After it was dissected, we don't know all what's wrong. You now we see all the deformity or the, the damage. So if I have a rider, a male rider, what has a straight lower back, long straight tailbone, butt muscle low to the horse, and a high pubic symphysis in the front, that's the bone. Then I make my ground seat high in the front, low in the back. If I put a lady on it, I don't care if you're skinny, heavy, Asian, American, European, they all have the same birth channel. And they in general all have more curvature in the lower back than a male spine. 
not my words, medical words. Due to the fact that you have a short, a, a tail, a burst channel, your tailboard is shorter. And due to the fact you have more curvature, your gluteus maximus sits higher away from the horse than the male. But here's the important part. Your front bone, the pubic symphysis is lower on the saddle. Here you can see how long the tailbone is on the male versus the female. My point is, okay, if you do not need to, if, if you fight in your English or Western saddles to get your shoulder, hips, and heels alignment, if you're sick and tired, where veterinarians and, and trainers say your horse will have massive stress here and here, if you don't ride soft and softness is when the horse and riders align. That's not softness, okay? The leg is forward, the knees are turned out. So who am I to talk about what is right, what is wrong? You can do that at home. Stand in your Tai Chi stand. What is a Tai Chi stand? You put your feet minimum 24 inches apart, put your hands in front of you and stand straight, half knee bent. If you turn your hands around and hold reins, that's your riding seat. That is a soft seat. Curvature in your lower back, neck, shoulder, hips and heels. Now I can do my slide and stop. I can lean back, forward, I can do my barrels, whatever I need to do. I'm over the center gravity of the horse, but I need to pivot in my pelvis. So again, when medical doctors write books about this, I, as the trainer, saddle maker, body worker for horses, all right, I can ignore what signs tell me, or I can say, holy cow, all right, so there is, People who, who know the why, maybe I follow those people. People who say, yeah, uh, it makes sense that there is so much difference between the two sexes. Once I got the right fit to the rider, I go to my horse and none, none of these points should be hit. Girth, a huge problem in English, not so much in Western. They seem to figure out where the right girth length is. English, unfortunately not. Also, the problem with uh, overpriced English girth with too much elastic costs more problem than people really want to hear. If I make a horse gait, buck, lateral, all I have to make sure that the flare in the back, the back flare, again, the word is flare, it's not big enough. So I can see the time is running so fast, and I know we started late, <laughs> and um, I have talked a lot about spinal damage. We can fix it on site. We can do operations. Okay, we can do all that. But once they're fused and all together, it is too late. So when I see a rider, Western or, or English, always fall to one side. If I don't pay attention, if I don't pay attention which side the main goes, then the problem starts. It's like a snowball going down the hill, an avalanche. It was a U.S. colonel in 1857 who taught that lesson to all saddle makers worldwide. McClellan made a saddle where the cinch can go in different locations on the left and right side. Why did he do it? Because just like horses, they're right-handed and left-handed. Yes, some of them more so than others. But if I don't have a equipment where my girth matches the girth groove. You can see there's many saddles that have different um, cinches or different rings for the cinch. Okay, English and Western the same, but I don't know which one to use. The problem starts and you can have that for a saddle you paid $100 or you can have it for a saddle you paid $15,000. So it's a nightmare and, and hopefully we can, this was just a little taste. <laughs> Did that make sense what I said so far? Oh, yeah, this is all fantastic. I actually had some the, some points of some things that you brought up um, to expand on. Uh, one of the things that you said was horses don't know how to lie. And I think that was just put really simply and perfectly because it's so true. They do show all 
of what they're feeling. It's just up to us. We have to be able to read it and not only read it, but acknowledge it and accept it. And that's one of the hardest parts is being able to go, clearly my horse is communicating something to me. I need to acknowledge this and respect it and not just dismiss it or call them being, you know, being bullies or malicious or whatever. You know, there's lots of terms that can be used. So I thought that was really great. Um, I wanted to see what your thoughts were on shimming or using more pads or whatever for saddles that are slightly too wide. And I know that's a problem that just because um, it's not squeezing them doesn't mean it doesn't fit. And we've got a whole different set of problems there, but is it potentially, I don't know, I guess I just want to hear your thoughts because you talked a lot about saddles that maybe were creating pressure points that are that too narrow of a channel, all of that. What about on the other side of the spectrum? Because that is really common in the Western world is we just buy a wide quarter horse <laughs> trees and then just put a lot of pads underneath your thoughts on that okay so as i i think i showed you yeah, i showed you those yeah some of them they're uh, sit inside solid you can't do anything with it and some of them have a stitch in the felt or you have pockets you can put them in and out i'm a big fan of shimming so long we understand where and what it does. If I look at the saddle in the front, behind the shoulders, okay, the ribs have a different angle than in the back of the saddle. So whatever I do in the front almost have to be shimmed opposite in the rear. Horses are not camels, horses move diagonal. And I compare shimming a lot with um, insoles. When I say insoles, sometimes people buy insoles for their shoes because they have a flat foot or high arch or problem with their ankles and they get insoles. No human would ever get insoles, none, and put them on their flip-flops or on their open toes. So where they fly out or shift and then they land wrong. But we do it with saddle pads. If you have saddle pads, if it's sheepskin, if it's thin line, if it's felt, doesn't matter. If it's not secured to the saddle, I think shimming is worse than good. Why? Same with the soles. You've got to make sure. I mean, with the sheepskin western pad and the felt pads or the Navajo pads or the wool pads, they have a good grip to it. And a very easy way for you, you take chalk, outline the saddle at the beginning of the ride versus at the end. How much did the pad move? And most important, how much did the shim move? When you put shims underneath, you know, it gets very tight in the front, it lifts the middle, and then it puts axis pressure in the back. So by making it softer in the front, because we already have a problem, it's too low on the withers or it pinches, we sometimes create the opposite. On a Western tree, okay, when I make a Western tree, rawhide, plastic, wood, doesn't matter what I use. Okay? I need to know seven different ways how the bars have to be, the length, the arc, the twist. What is the twist? This is a different degree here than there. So from front to back, so let's use this part here. Okay, so we can see how this is one plane. Now I twist it. So you can see it's steeper in the front, flatter in the back. So that's what they call the twist of the side, the bar, the rock of the bar. So I always say, determine first what is the problem. And when you shim a saddle, stay away with the stallion bites. And that is the worst area you possible can put a shim, I'll show you. No matter what animal you have. Um, here's a better picture. This here is the cranial nerve 11. That nerve feeds into the wither muscle and connects with the cranial nerves all the way down here. So three inches down in front and behind the withers to the end of the withers. That's where the horse bites. The other stallions, when they fight for the herd or when the mare is in season, he bites the mare, she can't run away. So now if you put a pad there and now you make the saddle even tighter, you need to ride 20 minutes before this nerve is numb. All you really do is this area all atrophies. Okay. and then eventually gets these little bubbles. People say, 
Well, I ride better, but I got these water bubbles now. So again, I'm a big fan for shimming, so long the shim stays in the spot. And you do not put any shims four inch, end of the main, four inch down to the back of the withers. Visualize a triangle here. I have a horse behind me here, like a little wooden horse to explain it better. Take rid of this western side of the sec. Here you can see it. End of the main, four inch down. Never ever put any shims there. Always think about where your bars are of the western saddle. You have three different areas where the bar would sit. And when you think of shimming, think about pads with areas where you have shim pockets, we call them. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and funny enough, well, not really funny, it's sad. A lot of shims, that's exactly where they go. <laughs> it's in that no-go zone. Um, I find that too, that area is um, when mounting, sometimes people will put a lot of pressure in that area, either because the saddle is moving while they go to mount or they're putting their hand in that area and it will cause the horse to dip and move away from it. So definitely that whole area is very sensitive and yet a lot of saddles put a ton of pressure all in that area. Yes. So that's really great information. Um, so I also wrote down a bunch of new stuff that I thought it was really interesting. You talking about the increase in cortisol and the higher stress levels and all that. And I also really found that, um, what did you, the smart, the, uh, oh my gosh, what was it? The Apple watch for the girth. That was really, that was really cool. I'm going to look into that some more. Um, I'm always looking into new stuff like that. And then is this an example of that channel, the width yes. right there? See, there are English saddles like Western saddles, which have a hand width space because you've got to stay off the spinal nerves. Okay. And an English saddle stops here, here. Western saddle goes all the way back here, all the way to the blue area. But the front, front flare okay, needs to be there. For this horse here, you can imagine, see how atrophied is behind the shoulder? That Western saddle would need a huge flare. Yeah. So most of the time, your quarter horse, your um, horses that were written in a Western saddle don't have these massive atrophy through here. There are some, okay? But very good visualizing here where the sh shadow is, stay off that when you shim it. Focus in this area. You see in the end of the picture, a little bit bright area, a little lighter. That's the ring of lights. And the ring of lights is always over the lumbar area here where no horse tolerates any pressure. So it's very, very important that the saddle stays nicely off the lumbar area. Super, super critical. Now, I do wanted to show you something a little bit more how we can help people to check their own saddles, what people can do and how to, uh, maybe I can show you this one here. Uh, there, there are no Western saddles. Um, let's say you and I have a horse together. You can open this concho here. You do that same on the other side. And then you lift it up. And then you can put different ground seats in it. Because if I have not the ability to have a birth channel and I can't bear a child, in other words, my, my front part of my saddles, my, my pelvis looks more like this, I can't force myself on a rawhide reinforced Western tree and then bend my back, it hurts. And this is what I learned at Vienna, the Spanish riding school. Since 400 years, the rider sits for, 400 years, sits for a year on the launch line to develop a seat. We buy a horse, we smack a saddle on, off we go. Okay? So the question is, why do they do that? Because you can have a very light rider be a nuisance and be the problem, it's not the saddle. It's the way the rider sits and bounces in the saddle on the horse. And the horse says, oh my God, can you sit quiet? And then you have a heavy rider and they ride very smooth with the horse. And that's what I wanted to capture or mention in the beginning of our little talk that it has to be comfortable and fitting the, the difference between two structures, male and female pelvis, 
And it, 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 this, this is the holy grail when it comes to saddle fitting. But for myself, I taught so many people when I taught lessons and the one or the other girl or lady was complaining. I, 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 I wasn't a gynecologist. I didn't learn in school. Yes, I learned in school female and male parts, but nobody, and I'm a saddle maker, nobody told us there's nine structural differences between the one sex and the other sex. Now, if the most important aid is your seat, don't you think that's important in selecting a saddle or fitting a saddle? All right, so that was for me mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I'm seeing a lot of changes in improvements and just big shifts in the English saddle world. And I'm all here for it. One struggle that I come across with my clients and myself um, personally is there's, <laughs> you can go and look for a custom Western saddle that is suited to you and suited to your horse, whatever. Um, they oftentimes when they refer to custom Western saddles, it's like you get to pick out the leather color and the tooling and whatever. It's not actually custom fit to you um, or, you know, a male or female. And it's also not uh, custom necessarily to your horse. And that's something that I'm really looking forward to with uh, presenting this information and spreading it. And I was really excited to see you guys start to develop a Western saddle line. Um, and one of the questions I actually, I had another thought that came to mind, if you don't mind, yeah. could you talk a little bit about the weight bearing area and how, um, you talk in other videos I've watched where you talk about the English saddle and the weight bearing area, not going past the last rib, if I'm correct. Could you talk about that in relationship to the Western saddle? Because most of the Western saddles are much longer than an English saddle that's right and it, it bases down again if the saddle fits the right so as the saddle maker what is absolutely important is the hip circumference when you sit in your english or western doesn't matter again what model it is western or english the fender length in other words from the top of the pelvis to your heel then from the heel to your knee and from your knee to the top and then your circumference of your thigh when that is written in they can select Western or English, these nine points. And when they select this correctly and you sit correctly in the center of the saddle, okay, not leaning forward, not leaning back, you will be have, you have the ability as a rider to choose where you want to sit. And I always say it has to be like a treeless saddle or a bareback saddle. When you ride treeless or bareback, you will never, you can do that one day. You can sit yourself, and I saw pictures from you there when you sit on the horse without a saddle. You can just get shock, outline your leg where you sit, then put your Western saddle on and kind of look through the fender. Where's your leg now? And I guarantee you, you sit further back. And if you sit further back, you sit in an area which is super difficult for the horse to carry you. Why is that? because this is a horse from the bottom. This is the sternum. And then the rib cage splits. So if you sit further away from that end of the mane, the further you sit away, so further you sit in the soft zone, in an area where the horse has a very, very hard time to catch you. English style, Western style, doesn't matter. So if you sit very, very far back and your rib cage ends here, the last line, English or Western, now you're sitting on an area where the horse has to really hold you. You would never, never sit there treeless or bareback because it's very bouncy. So by having the right custom saddle, we just talked about it, where you sit in the center, you can still slide back for your sliding stops or when you rope or team pin or whatever you do, okay? You can still move around. But if you're forced into the rear of the saddle because you're having the wrong saddle, okay, for you, the butt sits back, the indent in the loin can happen just as much with the English than the Western. So now I come to your question, the, how long the Western saddle is, okay? How long the Western saddle is, it depends on what type of saddle it is. Is it a tracking packing saddle? The bars are longer. 
double skirt, single skirt saddle, round skirt saddles. The weight should always stop where the candle stop. This here is just to pack on your tent, your kitchen, whatever you want to schlep around. Okay, so this has no purpose than to put weight here, but away from the lumber. So the saddle has to stop at the last rip. I have to get ready for my next um, seminar. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely fun talking to you. And um, I um, spent a, quite a bit of your time on your, your website. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Keep up the, the good work. And I um, would love to, to share with you a little bit more when we talk about the axis of the rider. That's the balance point between the male and the female. And I'd love to talk a little bit more how easy it can be to get a custom Western saddle, even from other manufacturers. And I would love to talk to you a little bit more how to, to help you, audience, and you to check, is the saddle fitting for you and your horse? In the long run okay and right. yeah good uh, you mean today you want to talk about it more right now or no, un unfortunately i have oh, okay. to um get <laughs> ready time. for my my next yeah. appointment but yeah. um maybe we should we definitely can... schedule a follow-up that would be fantastic like a part two i think that would be great um there was also some talk about you being on the podcast but i think actually a live stream is better with the visuals for this type of stuff uh, i think that would be fantastic um and we did have one question in the chat uh but what we could do is maybe somebody from your team could jump into the chat and answer that question so you can go i know you have to run um or i'll see if i can answer the chat myself the question uh, i don't want to keep you Let's too much do that. that's one more question but then i really have to go okay sounds good <laughs> sorry about that um uh, jimmy asked what would you do to for school horse saddles as in both genders ride in the same saddle so are there any tips or tricks that you have for somebody who's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place they can't they have to use that same saddle for everybody is there anything that you might suggest for that yeah so first of all start thinking completely different start mm -hmm. thinking how you buy yourself a riding helmet or western hat because if the Western hat doesn't fit right and you gallop down the field that flies off your head, it's annoying. If it's so tight, you get a headache, it's annoying. So not only does the hat has to fit from front to back, also it has to fit from left to right. And then the side can't just flare open. It has to sit properly. So on the head, you got the length, the width, and then the side. And then the same thing applies to side. I would always recommend I always recommend to go to saddles what have adjustable bars. There are saddles that come in leather, sheepskin, or felt, what you can detach. They're called split bars. So you can take them off, and then you can have, let's say, one of your school horses is so round, but so wide. So how do you stop the saddle from rolling? Right? Especially when you do rain. There's the last thing you want that the saddle always rolls to the side. So you make the bars wide and then the side has to come in. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you set the bars to the outside and then you hug it. Right? So you hug the horse. So what if you get a horse and, and the customer really wants to ride this horse and you haven't been training. He's a little bit more Anglo or he's um, kind of thoroughbred. Right? You want the bars coming in but flare it out. So by having the option, there's many Western saddles now. We offer all our Western saddles with the adjustable bars, because if you get a saddle that fits you, you last longer than the horse. I'm sorry to say that. Yeah. But in the time when I competed, I went to three horses, not because I rode them all in the ground, just because you know yourself, there's always something going on with the horse. Mm. And they change. And if I have scientific, I have veterinarian, body workers. I have trainers who says, I trained this horse so good now, he can go to the next championship. And I see his chest is so wide. Oh my God, that damn tree is too narrow again. Right? I always would go with the Western tree I can adjust, either online with a fitter over FaceTime or um, for people who come to my barn. Where do you live, Adele? I know you're in Texas, but where? Uh, outside of Austin. 
Yeah, so we have let lots of people who constantly come to Austin, Houston, for Dallas, uh, um, Dallas worth and, and so on and so forth. So these are so the- what, So what you're saying is to invest in a saddle for yourself that fits you properly and then make sure it's an adjustable saddle that would be able to fit a variety of horses. Ask your Western saddle maker, can I adjust my bars in seven different ways? Length, rock, front flare, back flare, twist, and so on and so forth. So that's yeah. for me a, a must. Otherwise, yeah. like you said, I'm, I'm getting a very expensive saddle. For me, $800 is a very expensive saddle if I can use it. Yeah. If it hurts my horse. <laughs> yeah, it becomes very expensive very quickly if it's causing damage too. <laughs> So if I have a school saddle, as I said, multiply yeah. seven times seven into each other, you know how huge the number can be. Mm. I have well, to thank go. You. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This is all fantastic information. And I know all the people who will be watching this video back or currently will are finding this very valuable too. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And, and what we could maybe do, if you're mm -hmm. up for it, we can always pick one or two topics. I can prepare a little bit. Yeah. We can pick the next topic for next time because this time was just a little bit get to know each yeah. other, what's all out there. And um, yeah, let's dive I in. I, I would love that. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Bye. Nice to meet you. Keep yeah, up you too. Work. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, anyway, so guys, that was the end of our live stream with Schleza, and it was a fantastic. I have a few minutes if anybody has any questions they want to pop into the live chat. I don't, I am not a professional saddle fitter, but maybe I can help out a little bit. We could talk about behavior and saddle fit a little bit more. Um, such a fantastic meeting that we had, and I apologize for the little bit of delay and technical issues in the beginning. This is my first YouTube live stream that, um, yeah, so I've done lots of live streams, but never had to connect it with YouTube. And then not only connect with YouTube, we had to connect it with Zoom so we could share those fantastic visuals. Uh, so, you know, something I wanted to expand on real quick towards the end while I see if anybody has any questions that they want to pop into the chat is some of the behaviors that you could be looking for when it comes to saddle fit and signs that your horse is not enjoying their saddle, that their saddle is not fitting. Um, so a couple of those signs are going to be things like head shaking and tossing, like throwing their head up and down side to side, things like that. Um, could be um, widening of the eyes, tensing of the muzzle, of the nostrils, of the lips, the mouth, um, ears back, ears out to the side, even if they're just held out to the side. Sometimes that can be a sign of just coping with a lot of uh, discomfort and conflict. Not always, but sometimes. And this is something I'm going to pre, I'm going to kind of add in here watch for multiple signs. Usually one on its own is not a straight indicator. Uh, we need to look at the whole body, the whole horse. So abnormalities in the gait. So if you find that your horse seems sound in the pasture, but then you get on and ride and then they're kind of, you know, short striding or a little bit off or whatever, please take that as information that something is going on when you're riding. It's not that your horse is faking it. They're not pretending they are actually in discomfort. Tail ringing is another one. Tail swishing, lots of tail swishing bucking, rearing, kicking out, holding the tongue out to the side or holding the mouth wide open while riding is another big one. Teeth grinding is another one. Um, let's see, let me think of some other ones that might show up. Man, there's a lot. Uh, bunny hopping, um, crow hopping, cross cantering, counter canter, um, swapping leads randomly, being difficult on one lead over the other, not really um, striding out, so not having a big fluid gait under saddle, not being able to track up from behind. Really, there are so many things that could be um, related to your saddle fit and not just related to saddle fit, but this is what we, for the horse, I mean, but it could also be how the saddle is fitting you. So if the saddle is fitting you incorrectly and causing you to have poor equitation or poor seat, um, this could actually be causing discomfort to your horse, just like we talked about is that's such an important aspect because you can be a... Um, you could be riding as, you know, the best as your saddle is allowing you to, but if it's not really fitting you very well and it's forcing you into a seat that is not ideal, it could actually be causing discomfort or just disturbances to your horse, even if the saddle does technically fit the horse. So how you're riding plays a big role in your saddle fit 
plays a huge role in how you're writing. I know for myself, um, when I switched over to writing from English to, so hunter jumper and then dressage, and then from dressage to Western saddles, I switched to like a basic trail saddle from a reputable brand. Uh, but I found that I was kind of surfing in the saddle. Like there's so much room. I was moving around a lot and I was used to have being a little bit more tucked in a little bit more supported. And also I found that a lot of the Western saddles were pushing me way back. Like we talked about just a moment ago, they were sitting me into a chair seat and it was so hard to hold myself in the right seat, even though I knew the correct equitation, even though I had countless hours of riding lessons and I could see it in the videos and I could see, I'm like, man, that seat is wrong, but I could not hold it for an extended period, no matter how strong I was, because the saddle was forcing me into the incorrect position, which was then causing my horse problems and then causing me problems. <laughs> and so it was just round and round and round. It was a cycle. And um, I really appreciate this information because that's something that you know, I've known about correct sitting, fitting saddles for horses for a very long time now. Well, I shouldn't say very long for a long time now. Um, but something that has become more and more obvious to me or not obvious, it's just become more of a, a realization to me is how important that the saddle fit is for the rider too, not just your seat size. And this is where we need to, you know, we, he brought up the seven points of the, the rider's fit. Uh, something that we like to focus on is the saddle, the seat size, right? So how far is it from the front to the back? You know, that's your sit size, your seat size. Uh, you just need to find a saddle that has that size seat for you. That is just the beginning. <laughs> there is so much more information. And if we are going to be riding our horses and, you know, not everybody that has horses rides and that's you know, or um, not every horse is rideable. And because of some of these issues, sometimes the horses have had ride ridden careers and they've had permanent damage done. I have a couple of those um, and that's okay. I love hiking with my horses. I love doing everything else. However, if we are going to ride, it is imperative that we make sure that our horses are as comfortable as possible. So not only that they can perform the job we're asking them to do, but that they're happy and willing and um, comfortable in that task. Because a lot of horses will put up with stuff, right? They'll put up with a lot of things that... Um, that we're asking them to do because they're a very peaceful species, but as very um, empowered and educated and uh, equestrian horse caregivers that really want what's best for our horses. It's so important. This part, this aspect is so important. And to expand on that, if you are training with clicker training, positive reinforcement, you have a cooperative care approach to your training you can do all of the groundwork in the world. You can train all of the start buttons in the world. You can be just the most amazing trainer of, out there. But if you get into that saddle after your horse is given the start button um, and if they're doing it cooperatively and you get into that saddle and it's painful, that could be one of the reasons that you're not seeing a repeat of giving that start button. So that it couldn't, it could be that it's not just the training, that it's actually that there's pain related. So when we are training with the Lima humane hierarchy focus, like I do and I teach, this is big. This is so important. If we are going to ride with that mentality, with that focus, with that purpose to, um, to just make sure that we're being the least intrusive, minimally aversive that we can be, and that we're using as positive, pleasant, low stress training approach as possible this is a key part of it, especially when we're looking at the humane hierarchy, it's important that our horses are comfortable. And a lot of times I will see people um, where they're doing the training and everything is going well on the ground. And then they'll start the riding under saddle training and everything is going well there, except for in a couple of rides, things start to backtrack. They start to go downhill. And a lot of that is probably not a lot. Well, I can't even say I have to look at the situation as an individual, but sometimes the reason the training starts to fall apart, the reason the horse starts to kind of give the no or give you the stop button sooner or um, not wanting to be as quick about giving the start button or just doesn't seem as eager to participate in the riding is due to the saddle fit and maybe not just the saddle fit for them but also how the saddle is fitting you and the position it's putting you in and then how that's impacting their ability to carry you and how that whole experience so we need to this is just a really key part to making that a pleasant experience if we're going to be riding very much like having a horse with a sound on their feet, comfortable feet, 
getting good nutrition, having um, all of their needs met as far as forage, friends, freedom, all of that, this plays a role in it. If we're going to be training with certain equipment or we're going to have certain training goals, we need to make sure that we're um, setting our horses up for success. And that's really what this boils down to is the uh, setting our horses up for success. If this is going to be a training goal, if this is going to be a, a, um, an experience, a thing that we're going to be doing with our horses is um, is riding, then we need to make sure that they are set up through six, for success through saddle fit. And that also we are set up for success. All right, guys. So I'm going to end the live stream here. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate each and every one of you. And let me know if you guys have any suggestions or ideas for our next live stream. I'm very excited for follow-up live streams and hopefully there'll be fewer technical issues. I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much.